and welcome back to the Meet the Translator podcast. My name is Dot and today I'm joined by Maya Lane Thicket for an episode all about business. Maya really knows her stuff so she's going to be giving us some great advice on having a freelance translation business, how to make a business plan, how to grow your business and how to manage the stress of running a business. But before we get stuck in, I'd like to recommend Translation Confessional. If you enjoy my podcast, I'm sure you'd enjoy this one. Here's Hafa herself to tell you why you should go have a listen. Hello, Meet the Translator listeners. My name is Hafa Lombardino, and I'm the host of Translation Confessional. I'd like to invite you to explore that side of our freelancing careers we don't talk about too often or very openly. The struggles, the time invested into learning and improving ourselves, the ups and downs, dealing with clients, meeting deadlines, and also the little joys that make up for everything. So stay tuned for weekly episodes every Thursday and subscribe to Translation Confessional wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks, Hafa. Now, let's chat to Maya. Hi, Maya. Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. It's really great to have you here. Thank you. It's uh, nice to be here. <laughs> so um, can you can you give everyone a little introduction as to who you are, what you do and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, so um, I am a Russian, Dutch and German to English translator. I am a free, like, freelance translator and I specialise in corporate communications, business, marketing and sports. Although I'm sort of still in the stage where I will take on other texts if they are vaguely within the same realms as those specialisms. So I grew up bilingually. I had a Dutch mother and a English father. Um, we did always live in the UK, but my mother spoke Dutch at home and my dad spoke English. We were lucky that he had taken uh, night classes in English so that it meant it didn't interrupt the flow. Although he didn't speak Dutch at home, he could understand so that we could all have Dutch in the house. So languages were a part of the everyday, really. My sister's four years older and she did languages at school and university. And then I kind of followed in her footsteps and I ended up taking German and Russian at university. And I realised as I was getting to the end of my university degree that I just wasn't (laughs) <laughs> my language skills weren't enough I decided to go into business which is kind of what I thought I wanted because I didn't really know what I wanted to do so I decided to move out to Russia um, for a couple of years so I went out and studied music out there for two years and I also taught English and I did a bit of translation on the side and I lived in St Petersburg and then I came back to the UK because I couldn't get a job without a visa and a visa without a job which is a funny old situation and then moved into uh, sales and marketing for about 11 years, which was international international business that was focused on paper and paper products. So I did use my languages in that sphere. Um, and then I had two kids, time off for reflection, realised that I had used my languages for my job, but that actually, after all was said and done, I did want to get back into translation. So um, with that in mind, just at the beginning of COVID, I was given the opportunity to um, to sort of decide whether I wanted to stay with my company or take voluntary redundancy and set up my own business. And that's what I did. Wow, you've definitely had an interesting journey into it. <laughs> I'm sure you will have sort of gained a lot of different skills from all the different things you did, which are helping you now. So today we're going to be talking a bit about business for translators. And as freelancers, we are essentially running our own businesses, I think. Um, even if it doesn't always feel like a business, when we're often just like one person just doing our thing, it definitely took me at least a year, if not more, to kind of start seeing my business as an actual business and not just hi I'm a freelancer I do this you know (laughs) um but like what what would you say makes something a business and how can we sort of yeah what what makes something a business so I think there's two questions here for me so what's make something business and what makes something a good business so for me in the purest form what's make something as a business is is either a product or a service that is a solution to a problem. So um, there has to be a need for it. Uh, business must serve a purpose um, because obviously otherwise there's no demand for it. So what you're 
selling or putting out there has to be something that people are looking for. And it has to be long term and have clear value in what you're offering, because if it if it's not sooner or later, you'll get found out and your business will have no legs. So at that point, obviously, in comes the area where you have to say that your business must generate a profit and it needs to have potential for future growth. Hence, needing to have a business that serves a purpose and one that is valid because it has to be long term. Um, And then what makes something a good business for me, this is a slightly different one. So I believe, and I know that a lot of freelancers don't like thinking about their their sort of translation business as sort of a full-on business. They wouldn't sort of classify it in as an international corporation or something. Um, but I believe that it is worthwhile thinking of it like in that way. So I believe a good business has strategic focus. I think that a good business has to have the right people in the right places. So you you shouldn't really be a marketing translator who's in a business that is specialised in sports translation, for example, you've got to have the right qualities and you can be as good as you want a marketing translator, but if you're in a sports translation business, then it's it's not the right fit. So then you've also got to have good operations, processes, workflows. And I think you've got to have good marketing strategy so that you've got enough clients always finding your services to make sure that your business is, is able to be A, profitable, like we said, and, and B, have the ability to continue and potentially grow if you want. And then the final thing that makes a good business for me is finances. So you have to have a focus on whether you are doing something that is sustainable, whether you can make the investment necessary to be able to build a long-term business. So even if you don't have that right at the beginning, I think you need to have some kind of a plan as to how you get there because hoping and praying means that you might not get where you want. Whereas if you have prepared and know what uh, environment your business sits in, then you can make steps towards a really good, viable business that will have finances to support it in the long term. Yeah, there are a lot of different um, elements that go into, into a business, I guess. So how do we sort of, like I said before, I feel like a lot of freelancers don't necessarily see themselves of as running a business how can we sort of develop that business mindset so uh i think there's a there's a difference between being a freelancer and just owning a freelance business and being a freelancer we can often find ourselves thinking i've got to chase every little bit of business that comes in because i don't know where my next paycheck is coming from you you almost feel like you're on the back foot like you've got to accept everything that's coming in you've got to be available all hours bend over backwards for people even accept late payments or low rates so i think when you change to being in the mindset of owning a freelance business even if you don't consider yourself one of the big players, that starts to change how you perceive your business. So you you start to think of yourself as the expert. You start to realise that the clients who seek you out and work with you are paying for your knowledge. They're not paying for you to be sort of just another employee who is available to them at all hours. They're choosing you because of your education or your experience or your previous career. So the people that you then work with, you need to think long and hard. Do they do they reflect the same values that you hold? Um, so if you're a sustainability translator, do you really want to be working with someone who is potentially putting putting strains on greenhouse gases in the world? Or do you want to work with someone in the fur industry or things like that? So these People, if you start to think, right, these are my values. So I want to work with customers who reflect my qualities and my values. And then I think another step towards becoming more in the mindset of owning a business, you've got to know your market. So you're not just someone who's sitting at a computer and accepting job proposals and sort of writing to people, I can do this for you. You've got to strategically think, what is my market? What do I bring to this market and why does that make me a good fit for these businesses? So I think you've got to do your research 
And then the last thing I think for mindset, I think you have to almost treat yourself like you would an employee. So that means respecting boundaries. You need to take time out. I saw a quote recently that said, everything works better after it's been unplugged. And this is like a favorite phrase of my husband's when he's talking about computers. He always just says, turn it off, turn it back on again, it'll work. And we used to mock this in my old work. We used to say, recirculate the power. But I do think it's true. If you wouldn't expect an employee to work till 10, 11, 12 at night, then don't expect yourself to. So that means taking breaks, having good working hours and treating yourself in a way that you would treat others. Mm, I, I love that. I love that. Turn it off and turn it on, <laughs> turn it on again. Because <laughs> it it's, it's very easy to forget to like take those breaks and like refresh yourself. Yeah, This actually sort of leads on from something that Susie said in last month's podcast about sort of having almost like giving yourself different people within your business and being like, okay, today yes. I'm today I'm my on the finance team, like the next day I'm on the marketing team. And then like the next day you're the translator or whatever. And like, I've started kind of having that in my head sometimes so that when I'm making the like financial decisions, or whatever, I'm doing it for the business. I'm not just like, (laughs) this isn't just because I want to make that money for myself. It's like, no, this is what's best for the business. (laughs) Like, and then like, so I think like that's, um, yeah. (laughs) I, I, I did like those points from Susie. Um, because I think as soon as you take the emotion out of a situation, it becomes much easier to handle And there's a good, actually, there's a good matrix for things like this, which is parent, adult, child matrix. And it looks at how you would automatically respond to a situation. Would you respond as if you were the child, therefore maybe on the back foot um, and a bit aggressive? And, And what they're basically saying is that you want to approach everything as if you were both adults, not parents, not children. So... In a sense, what Susie's model does really well is that it, it means you both treat each other like adults and with respect and with respect that you've both got your own demands on you at, at each end. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of these different things that you mentioned that what you said makes up a makes something a business, I guess that's kind of what you might put into your business plan. Mm. And yeah, I wanted to see like, would you recommend having a business plan and what actually is a business plan? So in short, a business plan is a document that sets out a company's future objectives and strategies for achieving those goals and objectives. So normally you would create one a year and then you would potentially do a review every three months to make sure it's up to date. Like I said earlier, business plans, well, businesses do well when they have good research behind them. So that is basically what a business plan sets out to do. It's not meant to be scary. All it's trying to make you do is be aware of your market. So if you're aware of the things that are difficult for you, you can either do something about it or and, and improve those things or, or avoid areas that might not be a good fit for your business. So in essence, a business plan is made up of, well, it can be anywhere from six or eight um, separate headings to about 10, I think you can see. But in my view, for translation and interpreting um, services, we only really need to focus on seven or eight of them. So that would be target market audience. It would involve your services, competitor differentiation, finding and managing clients. And then a sales and marketing plan actually often comes within your business plan, although it can be a standalone. And then goals and timelines and a financial plan. So they're the key elements that would make up a business plan, I I believe, for for translators and and interpreters, for example. So how would you sort of go about making your business plan and what would be the first steps to say you're going to sit down and be like, right, I'm going to make a business plan. What's the first thing you do? I, I would start out by... There's all sorts of templates that you can get online, actually, for business plans, which kind of try to give you the idea of what questions you should answer within each section. So I would first off not just look at the headings and be scared. So the first section is normally called company summary and aims. And that can often be termed 
executive summary. And as soon as you start hearing things like this, you think, oh, this, is, this doesn't apply to my business. Surely not. I'm just a little freelancer. But again, don't be scared off by the wording. And also just, you know, that's part of changing that mindset. You are a business and you do want to be profitable and you do want to keep growing. So maybe thinking of yourself in this way is a good thing. So the first section looks at, for example, it would ask you to determine your business name. It would then say, do you have a strap line? So Nike, for example, have the strap line, just do it. So everybody knows their strap line or tagline, however you'd want to say. And then you'd look at your company values. So that should be right up there. And then your mission statement. So a mission statement basically is your one sentence way of summarizing your business. So Tesla, for example, say Tesla's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So if it, this is one of those sections that's actually really short and you go, oh, I could do that in five minutes. But actually, it's OK if you find that you can't really think of the answer straight away, because it might be that going through the business plan helps you determine those other things back in section one in your executive summary. So don't get like don't get held up on it. Don't think I can't even do section one. I'm not going to continue with this business plan. It's just that it is hard to sometimes narrow down exactly what you do and what you want to be known for. So then after company summary, you've got target audience or target market, depending on how you want to talk about it. And this is where you would start to think about uh, potential clients, dream projects, or uh, even if, if you don't really think, I, oh, I don't know what my dream project is. Think about projects that you've worked on that you've really enjoyed. Why did you enjoy them? Why were they successful or why were they particularly pr profitable? And then what you try to do is take an overview of all of that. So are all these clients in a specific industry? Do they have similar characteristics? Are they all individuals or businesses? So B2B or B2C businesses, where are they based? And then why do your customers buy your services in particular? Try and sort of think what would set you apart from other people. And then if someone has come back to you, what made those people come back for repeat business? Was it your service? Was it your friendliness and your approachability? Or was it maybe that you had uh, slightly cheaper prices than your competitors? Or did you have specific specialization skills? So, you know, did you have 20 years in the sustainability sector? Why are those people coming back for more? Or did you deliver on time, for example? Even something as simple as that. Try to work out why them and then why they would choose you. And then the next section, I think it's section three of the business plan, is services. So, that's where you define what you were going to offer. So that would be everything from translation, subtitling, transcription, interpreting, all those kinds of things. And try to then include a bit more information, say, what are your prices? Do you have package deals? Do you have late fees? Do you have free revisions if you're doing proofreading and translation and minimum order charges? So they're all things that if you... Obviously, these things are set to change, and sometimes you make exceptions for certain customers. But this is where you would set out your ideal terms and your ideal services. The next section would be competitor differentiation. So this kind of ties into your target market and the questions we asked for there. So why would someone choose to work with you over the colleagues that you have on LinkedIn? How can you add ex extra value? What do you do better than others you know? So are you particularly good at proofreading? Do you have a particularly nice style when you write in English? And then look at also rates. So how do I stack up? Am I expensive? Am I not expensive? These aren't meant to be really difficult searching questions. It's just about trying to get the background for where you sit in your market. So therefore, include your direct competition, i.e. from other freelancers, but also it's useful to know what agencies, for example, are offering. Have a look at their websites, see if they've got rates on there. And if you're new to the business, check out the pros -E or pros, I never know how you say it, um, rates um, as, a, as a good starting point. After that, you would then look at how you find and manage clients. So what you're trying to do is, like I said earlier, your business should serve a purpose and it has to be a something that is in demand. So in order to be able to say, 
that you can help your client, you need to understand what problems they're facing. So what, what do they have that you can help them with? Um, how do your translation services, for example, help them solve a problem? Do they help you? Can, do they help their customers connect with them? Do they help them reach a new market, for example, or expand their services? And then what evidence do you have that shows clients how you can help them? So do you have qualifications, for example? Do you have testimonials that you publish on your website or even on LinkedIn or Instagram? Do you have references? And even if you don't, you'd be surprised by how many people would give you a reference simply if you asked them. And then you would think about how you connect with these clients. So whether that's website, email marketing, groups, job directories, for example. The next section of your business plan would then look at marketing and sales plan. So this is where you would normally work on a three-month basis. So you would try to keep things really relevant and focused. You can find sales and marketing templates online, but basically what you're looking at are seasonal trends for your business. That's part of your sales plan. Discounts, whether you've got different pricing for different customers, the pricing packages, and will your prices change over time. In terms of your marketing plan, how do your customers know you exist? How would they find you? Do you have a website but expect it to just be out there and someone come across it you know if you're not posting blogs on it for example if you're not sending links out saying that that you have a website how does someone find it what online presence do you have are you on linkedin and instagram have you been to any in-person conferences or do you network with any other freelancers so then the last two sections of your business plan are goals and timelines and financial plan so this is basically where you say to yourself If I want all these things to work, how can I tell if they're working and how often am I going to review whether the things that I'm doing are actually making a difference to my business? So you need to set SMART goals. So SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time based. So you don't just want to say I want to earn more money. You want to say I'm going to write five blog posts this month on this topic And I'm going to post them on my website by the end of the three month period, for example. So they have to be things that you can see the worth in. And there are models for smart goals that you can make sure that your goals definitely are specific and measurable and attainable, for example. And uh, your final part is a financial plan. So this is the kind of thing where you look at profit and loss. So like Susie said, Knowing your numbers is the first step to actually being able to sort of not be scared off by things like profit and loss and expenses. Just try to track what you charge, try to then measure your time, and this will give you profit and loss. Measure your expenses. Therefore, you'll be able to look at a sales forecast. If you've got history from the last six months, then you can make a reasonable projection for the next six months. Make sure you log any startup start expenses you might have. Think about a pension. It's never too early to think about a pension. I sound like my father, but it's true. <laughs> and have an emergency fund if you can, even if that's putting 40, 50 quid away every month. It will build up and you'll be, you'll be glad of it one day when your computer breaks unexpectedly or something happens to your dog. <laughs> so you, you need to try and need to try and include an emergency fund in your financial plan. And then the last thing I would suggest is adding a finance management tool to your financial plan, because this kind of thing really helps with forward planning. And I've just recently started using the LSP expert and I'm finding it quite good because other programs don't really seem to understand the requirements of a translator or interpreter, for example. So what does a finance management plan uh Wait, is that what you called it? Finance management tool, I think tool. it is, yeah. Um, what does that actually do for you? I've just started using it. I'd have to go on their website for exactly what their strap line is. But uh, basically, it allows you to plug in all your information, so who your customers are, what you're charging them, and then it will generate invoices for you. And once you've put in all that manage- all that information, you can also look at um they have a time option so i think i can't remember what tool you used for time tracking 
Toggle, I think, is one of the ones. Yeah. So it has actually a tool in LSP Expert that's similar to Toggle. And it means that at the end of three months, six months, it will automatically generate uh, finance graphs for you. So how much money you made, uh, it'll generate all the graphs for you that you can see which months are the most profitable, for example, when's the most, when do you experience the most demand in each particular segment? And you can classify all your customers as to do they work in finance, do they work in marketing? So then you can see trends for how much money you make in each particular segment and when their busy periods are, for example. That does sound like a really useful um tool. Maybe I should start <laughs> maybe I should start using it. <laughs> I think it's got a free trial. Oh, I'll have to check it out then. Um mm. thank you. So <laughs> I'm not so, paying for that little advertising plug. <laughs> So what what advice would you give to someone who wants to grow their business? So I think I think the advice I would give is similar to those starting out. I would say do your research. It's very easy to think oh I need to get a bit more experience before I go down this route. But actually there's a lot of legwork you can do before you start a business or even when you want to grow your business that will put you stand you in good stead. So you need to know where you make the best profit. You need to know where the most demand is. So that's why things like LSP Expert are particularly good because you can very quickly see, oh, the uh, finance uh, translation that I do, actually, I didn't realise, but it's quite consistent. Therefore, actually, it's, it's a really big part of the business that I do. I think the reason research helps you is because it makes sure that you're aware of all the pitfalls before you start. And it also makes sure you're aware of all the areas of opportunity. So it might be that you think, oh, well, I think I'm doing more business in the sustainability section than others. And I think it's more profitable. So I'm just going to try and grow in that area. But it might be that you didn't realize that you were doing something else, that once you started tracking your time, once you started to really look at the figures, actually that was more profitable or more interesting or where you had more direct clients. So I think that the more research you do, and obviously you could keep going forever and ever, you've got to be strategic about it. But if you answer the kind of questions that you get on a business plan that are structured and lead you to a conclusion, then that's going to be your friend. So I think specifically for people who want to grow their business, you've already got a proven track record of the clients you work with. So you could categorize those in a structure called a, got to remember, it's called a BCG matrix, which is a Boston matrix, basically. And it categorizes all of your products or services into four sectors. And they're called question marks, stars, dogs, and cash cows. So it basically has a table that has two axes. And the one, the one that that increases on the left hand side is the market growth rate and the one along the bottom is the market the relative market share sorry so for example cash cows their market isn't growing but you have a high percentage of that market so it means that you're quite competitive in that area but it's not going to grow. So if you were looking to grow your business, you would say, oh, I already do a lot of business in that sector, but that sector, for example, sustainability, although it is, isn't growing. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to invest in growing my business in that direction because I've chosen a bad example because the sustainability industry is growing, but for example, that industry isn't growing. Whereas something like question marks, this could be the tech industry, you know it's growing, you don't have a particularly large market share, so you don't know if you're going to be one of the the key players there. So it's a bit of a question mark, but it it represents a good opportunity for you. So if you can categorise your services and your areas of specialisation into those four sections, it will give you a good idea where you should potentially grow your business, which, which sector of your business you should grow. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. You showed me the um, the <laughs> the little diagram before with the with the different the little cow and the dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. <laughs> so I remember that one. It's a good one. I guess another another thing you'd need to do if you want to grow your business is to find more clients. Like say you'd looked at that and said, okay, I am now going to do try and do more work in the tech industry or something, for example, if you can see that it's growing, but you don't have a big market share. I guess you then need to be like, okay, well, I need to find work in that. And I guess you'd want to do a bit of marketing or something. <laughs> um, so, and you sort of mentioned having a marketing plan within your business plan before, but like, how would you, if you wanted to have a separate marketing plan, like how would you kind of lay that all out? So a marketing plan can be standalone or it can be part of your business plan. So if if you were scared of doing a business plan, you could start with a marketing plan. So it, it does look at the the question we answered before, how does a customer know you exist? So there's about eight strategies that you could include in it. So that would be market research. So you would do something that's called a SWOT analysis, which is looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities for your business and threats to your business. And then you would look at your target audience. So you've already kind of looked at that as part of your business plan. So it's kind of, it's already a tick in the box. So your business plan has already helped you with creating your marketing plan. You would look at market strategies. So do you offer high or low pricing? Do you want to be one of the people who offer high volume for a low price or the opposite? And then you would say, what are my sales channels? So they online or in person where do I make most of my sales? Does that come through LinkedIn? Does that come through my website? Do I do email marketing? And then you would look at goals and objectives, which you've also already done in your business plan. So you'd set smart goals. And then you would think about the media that you use to connect with your customers. So where do my customers hang out? Um, and therefore, where should I be? There is a perception, I think, a lot of the time that as a freelance business owner particularly you should be on all channels at all times in order to connect with your customer that's just not doable really along with running your own business and doing the work so find out where those customers are are they on Instagram actually or are they on LinkedIn and then if you're short on time or new to the business or particularly wanting to grow your business then only be in that particular place that you know is worthwhile and that your customer is on then you would look at a budget and an action plan. So you would say, how much free uh, revenue do I have to be able to dedicate to marketing? So do I want to do paid ads, for example, or do I want it to be free or do I want to use Canva, but I want to use the professional version? Do I have a budget for that? And you would work that in. And if you've got a business plan, again, this would form part of your financial plan. And then the last two sections are metrics, which is how you measure what you're doing. Do you have smart goals? Are you using Google ana Analytics to see how your posts perform if you're choosing to use Instagram and LinkedIn, for example? And they would allow you to figure out where most of your inquiries come from. And then the last thing is content plan and schedule. So a lot of people, if they're going heavily on social media platforms, would use a scheduling tool or I think you can use the, the same name content calendar so this would be things like Hootsuite or later yeah I guess there's like a lot of different ways you can you can market and a lot of different places and it can be hard sometimes to know exactly where to do where to do what and that's something that Kelsey had said I'm not sure whether it was on the episode I did with her or whether it was a LinkedIn post she did but one of the things she said was that it's better to do to go to one place and be there properly than to try and spread yourself everywhere and not do any of them properly. Um, Absolutely. So I think that's a good a good piece of advice. Are there any, I mean, you just mentioned the scheduling tools. Are there any other marketing tools that you would recommend? Yeah, so Later and Hootsuite are obviously content um, calendars. I've used both. Um, I think Hootsuite is good if you pay for the paid version. But if you want to get started with a free version, then I think the later the later software is good because you get a lot more for your free version. And then MailChimp does all of the uh, emailing that you might need to do. I think most people are probably quite familiar with MailChimp. But then I was sort of thinking a bit more broad in terms of marketing tools. So I was thinking about actually sort of 
business strategies and tools, if you like. So some of the ones I've mentioned today are SWOT analysis. So that's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Always good to do on either a sector of your business or overall. Uh, smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time based. And then the Boston Matrix and also customer persona. Customer personas are useful to look at. So you create an image of your customer, their likes, their dislikes, their needs, and that will help you create your marketing strategy and help you choose how you interact with that customer. That's yeah, that's really useful. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm gonna sort of go to look at this from a slightly different aspect now because one of the things like I think when you when you've got your mindset and you're like okay I'm running my own business you're trying to manage all of the different things even if you're being different people while you're doing it um it could still get quite overwhelming I definitely sometimes get really overwhelmed trying to stay on top of managing all the different elements of running a business do you have any tips for managing the stress that comes with it and the workload? Uh, so, I mean, first and foremost, I think take breaks. Take breaks physically, mentally. So get outside. Uh, I have a dog. I don't get a choice. <laughs> um, I have to be outside. And I saw a recent study that said, and I can't remember obviously all the data, but that as soon as you take your mind off a task and essentially put it into sleep mode, i.e. when you're working or walking and you're, you're doing something else like cooking, that actually that's when your brain performs the most important tasks. And that's when it figures out the answers to the problems that you're desperately trying to find. So the, it's almost like when you're desperately looking at something and you can't really focus on it if you then look slightly to the side you get you you somehow manage to refocus more effectively and then prioritizing i think that's why i like business plans and things like that is because it stops me being scared of things i don't know about because i've done the research and i've answered all the all of the worst what ifs there could possibly be and I've got a strategy for if something happened or I know what my biggest threat is to the business so if you prioritize right I want to get one part of my business plan done in the next three months and that's what's achievable for you then great at least you're making progress so prioritizing and, and trying to break it down into manageable chunks I think is invaluable because if you constantly look at the big picture and where you are now compared to where you want to be, I think it can be very overwhelming. And then making sure that you're focusing on what matters is a big one for me. So like I said, with the Boston Matrix, there's no point focusing on an industry with no future or focusing on an industry where there's lots of growth, but you're not enjoying it. Make sure that you're doing things that you feel are worthwhile or are interesting to you, are, are something that you enjoy. Um, because otherwise you're not going to feel the motivation to sit down every day for work. And asking for help is also part of that. Don't feel like you can't ask fellow freelancers. I think that's something I've learned over the last couple of years is it's a very rare thing that someone would say, sorry, I can't help or I don't have time. They would normally say, I can't help you right now, but come back in a month or something like that. Don't feel like you can't ask fellow freelancers for help because actually most people feel like what you feel and everybody sometimes needs someone to help them or a piece of advice so yeah try not to try not to sit on your own at your desk and get stuck into what you're doing and then think that nobody else feels the same get outside look at it objectively figure out what exactly is the the issue and and you should feel better about it once you've got a plan actually on that note there's there is one thing that I I have I, I learned it as part of like um like a, a business management mentoring scheme in my old business and it was a tool called the circle of influence and it's something that I strangely apply to all parts of my life now it's called the circle of influence and it's a, it's a circle that has three sections so the center section is called the circle of control these are things that you can immediately directly influence so should I drink that cup of water should I read my Russian book today so they're choices that nobody else helps you with this is just all you 
The second circle out is called the circle of influence. And these are things that you can do something about. You can influence them, but you can't necessarily determine what is going to happen. And then the outside circle is the circle of concern. So these would be things that you have no influence on. So the economic state of the country, for example, global warming, although you know you can do your bit towards global warming, you can't affect the the overall status at the moment, national debt, society, someone's attitude. So I think if you've got something that's particularly worrying you or upsetting you, I think it's good to try and think about it in relevance to this circle, um, because quite a lot of the time we can spend a lot of energy and effort thinking, oh, well, that person really upset me and they should do this and they should change that. And I've got to tell them this because otherwise they would never know that they're having a bad impact on my work. Actually, we can't control other people. The only people we can control are us. And if we start to look at it from that point of view, then we don't waste a lot of effort thinking about doing something about other people. We focus on positive things that we can do ourselves. And that has made a big difference rather than getting all riled up at something a project manager has sent to me I think it's better to take a step back and just think right what can I do about this because the situation is not going to change how can I make it better how can I improve my position and then move on when you've looked at those actual logistical questions I like what you said about um about asking others others for hope with stuff because I think it really does help sometimes even if sometimes I find like I know I, I probably know what I need to do to like deal with the situation, but sometimes you just need to hear it from someone else at the right moment. And like, yeah. I might just, you know, I might just message someone and be like, Oh, I'm really stressed by this. And they'll just be like, just go outside, go for a walk. And I'm like, yeah. okay, okay, I'll do that. And like, <laughs> sometimes yeah. like it helps, even though I know that like going for a walk will probably help me. Sometimes you just need to hear it from someone else. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think stepping away from it is always a, a, a good uh, good solution and that's what you get when you ask someone for help yeah I do find as well like I don't know if it's just me but I feel like I I am often kinder to other people than I am to myself sometimes so like Absolutely. when you tell someone else like you need to go for a walk you need to have a break like you've been working really hard or whatever whereas to myself I might be like oh no you've not done this yet or you've not done this yet and I feel like I think it's quite common we're harder on ourselves but we'd never say that to like a friend I'd never say oh but you still need to do this or you still need to do this like I just wouldn't <laughs> so I think like Absolutely. asking someone else they can <laughs> that goes back to the mindset shift to owning a business is treat yourself like an employee or friend because you would never expect some of the things you expect of yourself of someone else yeah definitely <laughs> Um, so do you have any final pieces of advice for any freelancers or small business owners, translators, anyone that's listening to this? Um, so like we were just saying, obviously respect yourself, but also value yourself. I think one of the one of the good things that comes out of going through some of these business tools is knowing exactly why you are good, why you have certain strengths and it's it's an it's about making sure that if you value yourself then your customer can value you as well but if if you're not prepared to tell someone why you're good if you don't actually know why you're good then how can anybody else know that you're good so physically writing down things that you have done well even at whatever stage in your career you're at whether that's early on setting out as a freelancer or sort of midway or even more established, knowing exactly what value you bring will help you get to the next level. And don't be scared of business tools. I think even the word business people go, oh, boring. <laughs> I don't want to do it. And for me, it's it, it's about knowing where you fit in the market. It's about knowing your market, who your customers are, and just having the research that means you can make useful and appropriate decisions for your for your freelance business if you want to call it a business or your passion so many things that we avoid 
we avoid just because we're scared of the unknown. So if you have worked out what the unknown is, it's no longer scary. And it means you can then break down all of the work you've got to do into manageable steps rather than thinking, oh, it's January 2022. How on earth am I going to get to where I want to be in 2023? If you've done your research and you know what you need to do step by step, little tiny baby steps, then it's not scary any longer. Thank you. That's Yeah, that's a great piece of advice because it can definitely be quite scary. <laughs> I've learned yeah. anyway. Um, I think it's scary for anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think especially as well, because like as translators, like especially as freelance translators, a lot of us come into this through a languages degree or a degree in, I don't know, law if we're a legal translator or something like that or through you know some other way not that many of us I th- I don't think that many of us have actually done a degree in business or you know learned how to run a business we just sort of jump into it and then we're like oh <laughs> like how do I <laughs> yeah I think and I think there's there are a lot of, of tools out there that can seem like they're quite scary and prohibitive but actually Um, If you know the kind of things you're looking for, so if you focus on, right, I want to know the strengths of my business and the opportunities, but I don't know what questions to ask myself. If you just Google SWOT analysis, all of a sudden it becomes much more approachable rather than thinking, uh, how to make my freelance business better? That's that's a question that's got multiple answers. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, thank you so much for... um coming on my podcast it's I've, I've definitely learned a lot from you and I think it's gonna be really really useful for lots of lots of other people so how can people get in touch if they have more questions for you or if they want to see what you're up to or they want to use your services so I am on LinkedIn primarily uh I'm on I'm Maya Lane Thicket and I'm also on my own website, uh, thenativecrowd.com, and Instagram as the Native Crowd as well. Yes, they're, they're the main places. You'll probably remember my name because it's a total mix of Dutch and Yorkshire. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I could never have chosen a more Yorkshire surname. <laughs> Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you so much again. It's been absolutely wonderful having you here I'll catch up with you again soon I'm sure yeah thank you thank you so much for having me it's been really good to chat to you and I'm a big fan of your podcast so uh, yeah it's great to be here thank you for listening I hope you found all this business chat as interesting and valuable as I have thanks again to Maya for joining me today Make sure to check out her contact details in the show notes if you wish to get in touch. And if you've got any questions or comments about the Meet the Translator podcast, send an email to meetthetranslator at gmail.com.